Hey folks, um, welcome to uh, the national holiday. You know that tomorrow is a national holiday? What's the name of tomorrow's national holiday? No, 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 it's Tom Jenkins' birthday. No. <laughs> but it doesn't matter when President's Day falls, it's always on the Monday. So, you know, that's how things go. Uh, welcome everybody today. We have a normal schedule coming up, the Lord willing. Uh, as we'll be talking about in prayer, uh, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but at this point, uh, we're planning on uh, all of our normal activities throughout the week. And remember, next weekend, what's happening? Our dinner and game day. So please plan to be part of that. Well, thank you. Uh. Happy birthday to you. Uh oh. Am I supposed to open it? Oh. Oh my gosh, there's two. Ah. Start with the other one. Now there's unwrapping instructions. Now, the way my thumb's feeling, hopefully this isn't a wrapping on a wrapping on a wrapping on a... Oh! Ready for next week. Uh, whenever the, 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 the chickens are ready to leave next week, those of us who want to could stay around and <laughs> play till three in the morning. Thank you so much. Uh, now what have we got? Uh-oh. It's a package within a package. Doing things with your off hand is... Uh, oh, what's... I need help with the tape. I'm not going to be able to get that. Get them keys out. Yeah, they don't have car keys anymore. <laughs> oh! You know what I said about going till four in the morning? Now we can make it six in the morning. I hope nobody has work on Monday next week. Thank you so much. Oh boy. Oh. <clears throat> Tom, if you remember several years ago, we gave you a card that read, In honor of your birthday, a tree has been planted in Israel. Your day to water it is Thursdays. Well, we're fairly certain that it, you didn't keep up your end of the bargain, bargain, but don't worry. God performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be. Be counted, he provides rain for the earth, he sends water on the countryside. Job 5, 9, and 10. Ta-da! And there's the tree. <laughs> is, is this a photograph? Or <laughs> Happy birthday.
Wow, the antique version. Yeah, the vintage, the... Uh, yeah, it's probably younger than I am. Oh, there's that. Well, thank you so much. Wow. It wasn't even called, uh, oh, it was called Risk, but it's the Continental Game. Well, thank you all so much. Wow. Oh, Father, you are worthy of worship and praise and adoration. To you we give all honor and glory. Lord, as we gather in your presence today, may your spirit direct our hearts. The Bible says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So we don't know what it is to think like you, to act like you, to desire what you desire. But the Bible says that we can have the mind of Christ. So I pray that you would pour into us the agreement with you, the perspective you bring, not only to this life, but to this life and its relation to eternity. Lord, may we pray prayers that are useful for your kingdom, that build up the saints, that glorify Jesus, and that help the fallen among humanity. For we ask this in His holy and precious name. O oh Lord, we live in a day of deception. The Bible says, the evil one has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And Lord, that blindness is increasing exponentially in this day. It was at one point merely spiritual truths that were doubted. The truth of your word, the person of Christ. But now we have come to the place of such deception that people can't even accept the truth that in the beginning you created them male and female. No, there's a hundred genders. Oh God. We've reached the place where not just evil is called good and good is called evil, but evil is celebrated as being beyond good. As being the only option. Oh God, I pray for the eyes of those who are blind to be open. We seek not their destruction, that would be easy. You could destroy any of us at any given moment, for you, we deserve the hand of your wrath beyond measure. But you are God who has set your heart to forgive. You have asked us, do you despise the riches of his goodness and mercy? Not understanding that these very things are what lead you to repentance. Lord, your goodness to us, the blessing that has been poured out, the wealth and, and, and ease and peace we have uh, been blessed with have not led us to repentance. It's led us to greater evil. The very people that shout about wanting equality and, and harmony burn down buildings, march in streets, kill people because of the color of the hats they wear. Oh God, over 20 years ago, 25 years ago now, a couple of very wise believers predicted that in the future Christians would be accused of haters, of being haters, persecuted for it. And we see that happening. And just like in the movie that was produced 25 years ago, the, the, the evil countenance on the face of those who make those yelling screams shows who the true haters are. Oh God, may we stand firm in this day. The Bible says, He who endures to the end will be saved. May we be those who endure to the end. Jesus asked the question, 
when the Son of Man comes, will we find faith on the earth? Lord, if there's no one else, may we be the one who is faithful. Lord, I pray that far from that, your church would be revived. That the glorious gospel would be empowered and that people's lives would be truly transformed. That Jesus would be lifted high and exalted and that his name would be honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you turn with me to Genesis chapter 12? Anyone know what Genesis 12 is? Genesis 12 is the introduction to... Abraham, the father of faith, the first person in biblical history. There is biblical prehistory, and up until Genesis 12, we have been in biblical prehistory. It is time before the flood, of which we have no history, because all of humanity was wiped out except for a handful. And it is not until the time of Abraham that God steps back into history and begins his plan of redemption again. Abraham lived somewhere around, very close to, 2000 B.C. So this takes place about 4,000 years ago. We know that that was not the beginning of human society. Egypt had been... Uh, an empire at that point for several thousand years. China has a recorded history that goes back long before that. Humanity had spread far across the world before Abraham uh, meets with God. But this is God's plan to redeem that humanity spread across the world. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. The Lord said to Abram, Notice his name is not Abraham there, it's Abram. Uh, They are two different words with two distinct meanings. God changed his name and gave him a new name when he truly became a person of faith. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be blessed, a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And the peoples, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, Abraham left as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. For those of us who might say, oh, it's time to retire, think about Abraham. Or if you don't like that, think about Moses. Both of them were in their 70s or 80s when they began their true ministry. Gives new hope to people who are reaching that point in life where the society says, step aside, we don't need you anymore. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions he had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the great tree at Morah, at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on to the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. I want you to notice something about Abraham, the father of faith. The first thing he did when he arrived someplace is he began to worship. He set up an altar. I talked last week as if we talk about what is the plan that God has to revive you, 
individually, to revive a church collectively, to revive the church in any nation or even across the world. And I talked about how we have to go back to the ancient paths. So often, these guys on TV, these guys in the national spotlight want to tell you there's a new plan, a new worship song, a new program, a new teaching, a new this, a new that, and a new everything else. We've got a new plan, a new program, a new way. But the Bible says, seek the ancient paths. Go back to where God actually is, not where your idol has placed Him. And today I will begin a seri- going forward in this series talking about that ancient path and the five disciplines that form that ancient path. And I want to talk today about the discipline of worship. Because we live in a day in which worship is being absolutely rejected. The prophecy of of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 that many will forsake the assembling of themselves together is happening in our midst. There are many who talk about, well, I watch on television or I get it on the internet. That would be as ridiculous, perhaps more ridiculous, than the person that says, I play for the Eagles because I watch them on TV. I guarantee you that if you got drafted by the Eagles tomorrow, and when the first training camp came up said, hey, I'm on the internet, you'd be fired very quickly. Worship is a participation And you notice that Abraham, the moment he went, wherever he went, he built an altar. His first thought was to worship the Lord. Now let's jump forward from Abraham to the next towering figure in Israel's history, and that is Moses. Moses is 80 years old when God comes to him and says, it's time for me to redeem my people. And he sends Moses back to Egypt, to the land where there's a price on his head. Moses doesn't want to go, but he does. Why did Moses, let me ask you a question, why did Moses go back to Egypt? Why did Moses go back to Egypt? What was his mission? To let his people go what? Many people would say, oh, to go to the promised land. But that is not what the Bible says. Look with me at Exodus 7.16. Exodus 7.16. Notice, as was stated by several here, Note, note uh, Exodus seven sixteen. Then say to him to Pharaoh, Exodus seven sixteen, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go, so that they may worship me in the desert. God's calling was not to lead the people to the promised land. His calling to them was to lead them to a place of worship. He reiterates that again in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to to him, This is what the Lord says, Let my people go so that they may go to a new land. Is that what your Bible says? So that they may worship me. And each time after each plague, God comes to Pharaoh again and again. You can read that through the rest of eight, chapter 8, on into chapter 9, on into chapter 10, as each of the new 
plagues comes, God says repeatedly over and over again to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me. God's plan is for His people to worship Him. That is the calling that they have. Now I want you to notice the world's response to God's call to worship. Because Pharaoh has a response to that. And it is an escalating set of demands. Notice how they go. Look with me, and you might want to make note of this so you can go through it and look at it later. Look with me at Exodus 8, 25. Exodus 8, 25. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said to them, Go, sacrifice to your God, but stay here in the land. And the first thing that Satan will say to a believer when you begin to follow Christ is, it's okay to worship God, but do it right here settled in the world. It's perfectly fine to worship in your armchair. And we can. But it's perfectly fine to do that. That's all God wants. Just stay right where you're at. Don't go to the place of worship. Worship God wherever you want. Right here. Stay close to the world. You don't have to identify with those, with those, those Christians that are so closed and narrow-minded. and They're not for all this, all this wonderful diversity that we're selling on the world today. You can do it right here with us. Worship here. When God said no and sent a second plague, another plague, verse 28, Pharaoh gives his second compromise. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the desert, but you must not go very far. You can go a little ways, but don't become an extremist. Okay, if you're going to go to church, that's fine, but don't really believe that Bible. All right, you can go and worship God, but keep it to yourself. Don't tell anybody else about it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You're going to go worship God, but only do it for a very limited time. Once a month is more than enough. Don't go very far. Don't wander off into being an extremist and actually practice what God tells you to do. And then the third one, jump over to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus 10. Pharaoh's getting a little more desperate now. It's the plague of locusts. They've had a number of plagues. They've been terribly uh, damaging to Egypt. Egypt is in utter crisis. Pharaoh's willing to compromise a little further. Here's what he says. He says, Pharaoh said, The Lord be with you. If I let you go along with your women and children, clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you have asked for. He says, Go ahead and worship, but leave your family at home. You don't want to force your children to worship. Why? They need to choose for themselves. I don't know how many people that that call themselves Christians have told me some some derivation of, well, you know, I've let my children choose how they're going to worship. Oh, really? Do you let them choose how they're going to eat? I'll have a Hershey bar and soda for every meal. Okay. Do you let them choose whether they'll brush their teeth or not? How about those showers? Are they optional? You know, you haven't showered in about three months. Oh, back off, Mom, Dad. Okay, it's up to you whether you wash or not. The 
But somehow when it comes to the things of God, we're not supposed to bring our families along. Let them choose for themselves. Joshua talked about choice. But what did Joshua say? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I was reading a story today I was critiquing for someone that was about a child gaining their independence. It was about a child becoming adulthood. And I wrote on them uh, uh, my definition of what an adult is. And I'll, I'll give it to you uh, as well. Uh, an adult is a person, a human being, who eats their own food, that they paid for with their own money out of their own refrigerator in their own house that they paid for by the money they earned with their own job. And if you fail any of those criteria, you are not yet an adult. You are still a child. And therefore, you need to be under the authority of the person who tells you you're going to go worship. Not an option. If you're a parent and you don't have that attitude, then you know, then know that you've fallen for Pharaoh's compromise and you've left your family behind. And then lastly, number four, look at Exodus 10, 24. Now the plague of darkness has come and the sun hasn't been seen for days. And people are getting jumpy. Do you, do you remember, what was it, a week ago we had that, was it four or five days in a row that just, it was cloudy? But this is worse. This is darkness. This is the sun don't shine at all. And people are getting desperate. And in chapter 10, verse 24, then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. And here we come to the last, com- the last compromise. It's okay, go worship God. But don't commit any of your resources to it. Don't give God lordship over what you you own. That's yours. That stays back in the world. But every single time between those two, and you can go back and look at it, every single time God said to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me. God called His people to worship. Now, somebody says, well, that's Old Testament. And you know, churches today tell you that the Old Testament, that's just, you know, we don't, we don't read that anymore. It doesn't matter that the Bible says all Scripture is inspired by God. And when it said all Scripture, what was it primarily referring to? Because what of the Scripture was actually present in all the churches? Primarily the Old Testament. Much of what we count the New Testament hadn't been written or certainly hadn't been distributed yet. But let's go into the New Testament. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Notice, worship was not merely a command in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. Turn with me to Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably 
with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Worship is a command of the New Testament as well as the Old. This idea that we can have our, our, our little personal God that we keep in our little, little personal life and not attach ourselves to worship is antithetical. Big word. If you don't know it, look it up. It is antithetical. It means it is in the exact opposite end of the spectrum from true Christianity. And there has never been a people who have known revival in any measure that did not commit themselves to public worship in a new, deep, and meaningful way. And if you want to experience God anew, you need to commit yourself to worship. Now, I want to talk very quickly about five attitudes. Five attitudes that we have to bring to worship. Five attitudes that we have to bring to worship. Number one. A sense of excitement. Enthusiasm. Happiness. Psalm 122, verse 1. Psalm 122, verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Notice the psalmist says, I didn't drag my tail out the door. Do we have to go again? He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Now, that doesn't mean that when we don't experience that, we should just quit. Often, God's test is, do we do what we are supposed to do even when we don't feel it? And in fact, sacrifice is more meaningful when it costs us more. So when it's hard to get up. When you're dep- what we call today depressed. When you're not feeling 100%. When you're not, when you're tired. When, when something kept you up all night. When you say, nevertheless, I was glad when they said, so I'm going. That's often the very time God meets you in worship. And every time you give in to the excuses and say, oh, not this time. It just weakens your spiritual dedication and pulls you away further. Number two, John 4, 24. John 4, 24. John 4.24 Those who worship me must worship me in spirit. We have so much carnality in the church today. We just sang an old hymn. Oh, wow. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name. There's a lot of people who would say, well, that's not my style of music. I like the contemporary stuff. That's why I go to worship, because I like the music. Well, good for you. But, but is worship about what you like or what God likes? Do you go to worship for you to do what you want? Or, or to surrender yourself to the God who gave you life? Now, 
We must worship God without carnality, spiritually. You know what the, you know what the first rule of, uh, of building an altar to the Lord was? You know what the first rule of building the Lord? Anybody know that? It could have no steps. Now that seems like a weird one, right? Why could it have no steps? Well, because how were the people of that day dressed? They wore robes. And if you're walking up the steps to the altar and the people are standing down there around, what's happening? You're exposing yourself. You see, all of the pagan rites and the pagan religions were about sexuality. The temple virgins who were anything but. And God said there can be no sexuality at all brought into worship. You can't attract crowds with carnal means. Yet how often in the church is that exactly what's done? We must worship Him in spirit. But also if you read on, in 424, it says not only must we worship in spirit, we also must worship in truth. Now, there's a couple of things about truth that we need to understand. There's two edges to that sword. There's two sides to that coin. There are two truths or two areas of truths that we need to understand if we are to worship in truth. The first is, we must be truthful about who God is. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul warns them not to worship another Christ. Just because you use the name Jesus doesn't mean He's the true Jesus. And we have so much in Christianity today that passes for worship that has, is disconnected from truth. We have churches that are accepting abominations. Right here in this county, we have a Baptist church who puts flags out in front of their church. Is it a flag of a cross? No, it's a rainbow because... We're accepting of gay people. Is it the rainbow because God said He'd be gracious and never flood the earth again? No. It's because we're promoting homosexuality. That church can never, at any time, for any reason, in any measure, worship in truth. Because they have denied the fundamental truth about who God is. Does that sound like I am not inclusive? Let me just say one thing about inclusivity. God has created a place to honor inclusivity. It accepts everyone. Every person can go there. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter where they come from. It doesn't matter what race, what creed, what religion doesn't matter what they believe or what they do. Every single person is included. That place is called hell. But there is a place of exclusivity. That place is called heaven. Because only those who bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord can enter those gates. Read through Revelation 21 and 22. There are gates to that city and no one who is defiled can enter therein. God begins to give lists of the people who are excluded. So you can preach inclusivity all you want. 
But all you're doing is preparing people for hell because God says there's a list of rules and if you want to come into my heaven, you'll go my way or you will go no way. Well, pastor, do you know how narrow-minded that is? Absolutely. That's because I believe the Jesus who said narrow is the gate. And narrow is the path that leads to life. And only a few find it. But broad is the way and broad is the gate that leads to destruction. And anybody can go in that way. I will not apologize for being exclusive. There is right and there is wrong. And the only and, and tolerance is not the only virtue. Truth must be maintained. And we must be honest about who God is. And we must worship the God of the Bible. Not the God of our imaginations. But second of all, there is another side to this truth. And that is, we must be truthful about ourselves. Jesus' condemnation of His own day is found in Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. Now bear in mind, Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, Jesus is not making this up for Himself. Jesus is quoting Isaiah 29, 13. So He is quoting the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus is quoting the Hebrew Scriptures. And there Jesus condemns the people of His day because He says, these people worship Me with their lips, but their hearts are far from Me. They make up doctrines about Me and then worship their false doctrines. Is that a description of the American church today? It struck me Oh, over 20 years ago, back in the 90s. They were really pushing these praise chorus back when it was tapes and then, and then CDs. And, and boy, they were selling like hotcakes and they were on TV with ads. And they showed a church with, oh, I don't know, two, 3,000 people, something like that, just swaying and swaying and swaying. And oh... And they're, you know, talking about how this, this worship, if you just get this tape, you'll feel so close to God and you'll, you'll experience such spiritual bliss. And they're going on and on selling their product. And all I could think about was if there were actually 3,000 people who were sold out to Jesus Christ in any city in America, that city couldn't stay the way the cities in America are. What happened when you had 3,000 people in Jerusalem truly worshiping God? The city was shook to the core. And it didn't stop there. It spread across the whole... And then it spread further. And it went to the whole world in less than a generation. Just because they had 3,000 sold out people in one city. It's so easy to worship God with our lips. Oh, I love Jesus. Really? Show me your calendar and ask, let me see how that plays out. Show me your priorities. Worship must be something that informs our entire lives. We must be honest with ourselves about who's the Lord of our lives. We must worship the Lord with excitement, with gladness, with spiritual truth, with spirit and with truth. Number four, we must worship Him with spiritual cost. 2 Samuel 24, 24. I don't know if you're familiar with 2 Samuel 24, but it's, it's almost an addendum to the book of 2 Samuel. It's kind of a, 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 of a 
nothing, it's not chronologically placed there because of where it falls in the narrative. It's, it's almost an add-on to show a couple of David's really bad failures. To show that David wasn't perfect by any means. And so as you come to the end of, of, of 2 Samuel and, and you come to chapter 24, Samuel ends his book by showing us some monumental failures in David's life. And one of them was when God told him, don't take a census. Now there's a reason why God said that. He said, I don't want you to trust in the number of people you've got. Don't tell me how many horses, how many swords, how many soldiers. Don't trust in the fact you've got a big army and a lot of people and boy, therefore you're powerful. I'm the one defending you, trust me. But David turned right around and goes, yes, Lord, and went out and did a census. And you know what God's response to David was? Okay, you want a census? I'll make it really easy for you. I'll bring the population of all of Israel to zero. Goose egg. I'll kill every person in the land. Then you can take any census you want. It'll be real simple. The counting won't even take more than a two-year-old. You can do it on one hand. Zero. And people began dying by the thousands. And David all of a sudden goes, oh, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen. And God said, all right, I'll give you one chance to make this right. You need to go down and you need to sacrifice in front of the death angel. Put yourself at risk. Don't send a subordinate. You go down and you sacrifice in front of the death angel. And if the death angel doesn't like what you're saying, you'll be one of the first to die. And so David rushes down to where the death angel is moving through the land. And he comes to a threshing floor and a guy's there working his land with a team. And he goes, quick, I need, I need wood for a fire and animals to sacrifice. And the guy goes, take them, you're the king, you can have them. And David says, no, I'll pay you full cost for them. And the guy goes, you're the king, you don't have to pay, just take them. David says, no. Because 2 Samuel 24, 24 says this, I will not sacrifice that which costs me nothing. So often, we want to sacrifice to God stuff that costs us nothing. Well, I'll just stay home and watch it on TV. Why? Well, because that costs me nothing. Well, you know, I'll just, you know, I've got to find a church that, that has a convenient time for worship. Now, I understand if we are in a situation where we're being forced to do things on a certain day, that there is some, that there is some cause to say, hey, can, can, can I find a place where I can worship? But it's just, I don't like to get up on Sunday morning. Wonderful, now you've just added a little tiny bit of cost. I find it amazing that people complain about, well, your worship service is too early. It's 9.15. And my question to them is always, oh, what time do you have to get to work? Oh, I have to get up at 5 in the morning. I have to get at work at 7.30. I go, wow, God's being so gracious. You get to sleep in for another hour and 45 minutes. What's your complaint? Well, we want a costless sacrifice. God says, no, it's got to cost something. Well, I don't like this. Good! There's a cost. Do it, not because you like it, but because God likes it. Is it in the Bible? Well, yes, but I want to find some place that I like. God has a place for people that want what they like. What's the name of it again? Number five. There are two things that have to characterize worship. Two Ingredients that have to characterize agreements, uh, uh, characterize worship. There must be both thanksgiving and praise. 
And those two things are separate. They are different. They can exist side by side, but they are not the same thing. Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Enter His gates with thanksgiving in your, on your tongue and enter His courts with praise. When you come to worship, you have to bring two ingredients. Thanksgiving and praise. What's the difference? Well, thanksgiving is somewhat self-centered. Thanksgiving is somewhat self-centered. It, it's not entirely self-centered. It's made to div- pull us beyond being self-centered because thanksgiving is giving thanks for something I have gotten. Or that someone I love has gotten. Or that something that meant something to me. Oh, praise God for, for my new job. Oh, praise God that that my thumb would work right. Oh, praise God. Something was done for me. Thank God my kids are doing good in school. You see, thanksgiving is about me. Now, it's better than not being thankful because not being thankful is, God, I've done it all by myself. I don't need to thank you. Thanksgiving at least acknowledges that it came from God. But still, there's a shade of selfishness in it. Because if I don't think God's done anything for me, then guess what? I don't have anything to be thankful for. Oh, good day. What's good about it? Okay, you have nothing to be thankful for. Praise, on the other hand, goes beyond thanksgiving. And that's why in Psalm 100, thanksgiving comes before praise. You come to His gates with thanksgiving. That's what opens the door to let you in. But as you enter into His court, it needs to change to praise. Praise isn't about me at all. It's not, oh, thank thank you God for that extra hundred dollars that I got in the mail last week. Oh, thank you God for that raise that I got at work. Oh, thank you God for, for the, my, my kids being able to come home for the holidays. Thank you, God. Whatever. Praise is, God, you are worthy of me exalting you regardless of what you've done for me. Praise is Job laying in his boils, his entire family wiped out, and his wife standing over him, shaking her finger, saying, curse God and die. And he's going, why should I curse God? Maybe I feel like God hasn't done anything for me today, but He's worthy of my worship anyway. Maybe I'm having the worst day of my life, but that's irrelevant. God is worthy of praise anyway. You know, when you look at the scenes in heaven, and we don't see a lot of them, but when God allows us to pull back the curtain just for a peek through the keyhole, and we see the scenes of heaven, the angels are falling on their faces going, holy, holy, holy. When in Revelation 4 and 5, we see the people gathered around, they're just falling on their faces, worshiping and praising. And you don't hear them saying, what did God do to me to, for, for me today? They worship God because He's worthy of it. Last thing. How are we on time? Oh my golly, it took way too much. I want to run through this really quickly. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Thought I had plenty of time. Boy, time gets away, doesn't it? That time, it keeps running and running. I want to talk last of all about the downward spiral before final judgment. 
the downward spiral before final judgment. If we want to know what it is to come to final judgment, then we need to understand the downward spiral to final judgment. And it's found in Romans chapter 1. Beginning at verse 18, Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth with their wickedness. Since they may, may be... Bleh, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Verse 21, here's the first step. Although they knew God, they neither glorified Him nor give thanks. The first step in the downward spiral to spiritual oblivion is to stop worshiping and stop giving thanks. When you say that you don't have time or need for worship, you have begun the downward spiral towards oblivion. Number two, they didn't give Him glory. They didn't give Him thanks. Number three, look at verse 22. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. The next step is you lose all your ability to think. You suffer through, through lies. I have watched people who were faithful believers for years and, and they begin on this spiral. They start absenting themselves from worship. They start stop being thankful and their thinking becomes so outlandishly idiotic that you can't even track it. And, and you'll try to discuss something with them and they go off on these wild tangents and you go, who in their right mind could think that way? Well, because their, their thinking becomes foolish. I've watched people do this. I've seen them destroy their entire... And if you talk to them, they think they're more spiritual than they've ever been. They have never been further away from God and yet they think that they're just like this. Number four. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God, uh, immortal God for images made to look like mortal men, birds, animals, and reptiles. Number four, they start worshiping things. Sports. Money. People. Activities. We have people now that don't even worship reality. They worship blips on a computer screen. Video games. I had, I had. Uh, there was an assignment in my school this week, and they were told, since it's a construction department, to uh, to do a report on on historic stairs. That, 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 that because they're learning how to build stairs that, that are just gorgeous works of architecture and, and engineering. And, and someone will go, can, can we do stairs from Minecraft? What? We, we worship blips on a screen. God help us! Next one. Verses 24 and 25. Therefore God gave them over to sinful desires, the sinful desires of their hearts, uh, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their body. They become given over to sensuality. Why do you think it is that our society is so obsessed with pornography and sex today? That gives you an indication of where we are on this wheel. This is how far we've come in that downward spiral. We're heading for the bottom and the cart is running at a thousand miles an hour. We broke the sound barrier 30 years ago and we're heading for oblivion at the speed uh, at Mach 3. 
They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served creative things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. And then verses 26 and 27, the next step in that downward spiral. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones in the same way. The men also abandoned natural relations with women, were inflamed with their lust for one another, perversion. Homosexuality, that whole alphabet that is extolled today. In fact, you can't get a job in Hollywood if you don't, if you aren't part of that alphabet. The uh, Writers Guild, the people who write all the shows and movies that are watched in America and across the world, have to be part of the Writers Guild. To be part of the Writers Guild now, they're insisting that you give a catalog of your sexual perversions. Are you LGBTQRXT? U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Because the companies legally can't do that. Companies like Disney can't demand that if you apply for a job, they ask you that question. So they have the Writers Guild ask that question, and they say, well, we're only hiring people from the Writers Guild. So they ask it for them, and they can go down through, and they can see where you are on the alphabet chart. That's how perverted we've become. And then finally, the last step, the final step toward oblivion, verses 28 to 32. Furthermore, since they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, they, He gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They are disobedient to parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they approve. And let me say today, they celebrate those who practice them. That's the final step before God says enough and blasts them with a bolt. Those of you who are somewhat near my age, did you ever believe that you would live in an America where cities would publish the streets that are so filled with human feces that they're unsafe to walk on a daily basis? They have maps. You can look it up on Google to tell you what streets not to walk down because there's so much human feces on that street that it's a health risk to step onto it. But do they do something about the problem? No, they just publish a map so you can walk around it. When I was a kid, there were some ghettos in America, but those ghettos have, have now grown to encompass the entire cities of some of them. It's unsafe to go out at night. Can you imagine that? Yeah, we can. If you'd have told my parents when I was in elementary school, we're going to put metal detectors in, in your... Uh, in your school to keep people with guns out, they'd have said, are you insane? On any day I went to high school, every single day I went to high school, there were trucks out in the parking lot, in the student parking lot, with three or four rifles in the back window. Often with the doors unlocked. Nobody touched them. Nobody used them. There were no school shootings! They had riflery clubs in schools. No one was killed. Today we have gun-free zones with big signs and they can't stop the people from killing. Not because there's too many guns. Not because guns are the problem. But because we are fulfilling those verses. Romans 1, 28-32. Depravity 
in the hearts of human beings who have been so lied to and addicted to sin that they don't know what else to do other than murder and kill. And it all starts when we refuse to worship. I hope you understand how serious worship is. Let me make one final statement. We're late, I know it. But let me make one final statement and I'll be done. And that is worship is undoubtedly the least sensitive spiritual indicator. If you come to the place where you no longer want to be at worship, you have crossed a whole bunch of spiritual lines and you are at the end of spiritual decay and you are on the first step of the downward path to destruction. So here's my question as we end today. Are you one who says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Somebody a long time ago when he was a godly man, or at least appeared to be, had a great message. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. He went off the rails and became a, a, a disgrace to God. Disgrace to Jesus and a disgrace to the church. That message still holds truth. Are you one that, oh, I can't wait for Friday? Or are you one who says, I can't wait for the Lord's day? I can't wait for the Lord's day. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Let's bow together. Oh, God. We live in a world that spurns worship that is not only on the downward track to oblivion, but is, is, is on the final step and, and is hitting the accelerator and the rocket boosters as hard as they can. God, may we be people of sanity whose minds are not corrupted by the lies and deception. May be, we be ones who say, no, I will worship. In Jesus' name, amen.